Agricultural products. Indonesia is an agricultural country. About 70% of its population work as farmers. Farmers grow rice, corns, cauliflowers, chilies, onions, sugar canes, carrots, potatoes, green beans, peanuts, cassava, and many others. They cultivate land and grow plants which can bring in money and they choose the right plants for the land. Ties why when we go to a certain place we will find only one kind of plant while sometimes in other places we find various kinds of plants. From the various plants in Indonesia, rice is the most important one, as most Indonesian people eat rice. We can say large number of rice fields in Java and in other islands outside Java. According to the 1993 agricultural census, the area of rice fields in Indonesia is 5.24 hectares. The rice fields can produce hundred millions of tons of rice. Thus, rice has been the main food for us. Farmers in fertile areas can grow rice well. In these areas they can even harvest the crops three times a year. They can enjoy it because their areas have a good irrigation, good soil and they know the technique of planting rice. In less fertile areas, farmers can grow rice and harvest it twice a year. Those living in the area where there is no irrigation can only plant rice when the rainy season comes. They can plant other crops while waiting for the rain. Paying taxes. Nobody likes paying taxes. Even those who know that taxation is necessary and just are reluctant to pay taxes. It is not pleasant to see part of your monthly income taken away from you in income tax. Ignorant people think this is an injustice and make a grievance of it, so it is just as well that we should know why we are taxed, so that we can see the fairness of the system. Every country must have a government of some sort, or life would be impossible. The primary duties of a government are to protect the life and property of the citizens, to maintain law and order and settle dispute between citizens in a just and orderly way through the law courts, to defend the country from foreign foes, and to maintain the roads and highways. Besides, may governments maintain and direct public duties need money. An army and navy have to be kept up, the police force and the judges have to be paid, schools have to be provided and teachers supported, Expert health officers and sanitary engineers have to be employed. Now where is all the money needed for the public service to come from? The question in answered by another. For whose benefit are all these service maintained? The answer is, for the benefits of the public. It is the people as a whole, rich and poor, that benefit by security of life and property, by the sound administration of justice, by the maintenance of roads, by the public hospital, public schools, and good sanitation. Therefore it is only right that the public, the individual citizens of the country should contribute the money needed, for the money the give comes back to them in the shape of these public benefits which all enjoy. So long, therefore, as we have a good and efficient government, so long as our money is being used in the right way, and so long as the burden of taxation is distributed fairly, as different classes can bear it, we have no right to grumble at having to pay our share of the taxes. Natural Disaster A natural disaster is a terrible accident, example a great flood, a big fire or an earthquake. It usually causes great suffering and loss of a large sum of money. The causalities are injured or died. Some people are homeless and need medical care. Floods occur when the water of rivers, lakes, or streams overflow their banks and pour out into the surrounding land. Floods are caused by many different things. Often heave rainstorms that last for a brief time can cause a flood. But not all heave storms are followed by flooding. If the surrounding lands is flat and can absorb the water, no flooding will occur. If, however, the lands is hard and rocky heavy rain cannot be absorbed. Where the banks are low, a river may overflow and flood adjacent lowland. 
In many parts of the world floods are caused by tropical storms called hurricanes of typhoons. The bring destructive winds of high-speed torrents of rain, and flooding. When a flood occurs, the destruction to the surrounding land can be severe. Whole villages and towns are sometimes swept away by water pouring swiftly over the land. Railroad tracks buckles and are uprooted from their beds. Highways are washed away. When a building caught fire, the firemen pitched in to help battle the blaze. Before the pumps were invented, people formed bucket brigades to fight fires. Standing side by side, they formed a human chain from the fire to nearby well or river. They passed buckets of water from hand to hand to be poured on the flames. The damage of fire did depend a great deal on where it happened. In at the country or a small village, only a single house might burn down. But in crowded cities, fire often destroyed whole blocks and neighborhoods before being controlled. Lake Toba Lake Toba, which is situated in the center of the Bukit Barisan mountain range, is an interesting mountain resort with Samosir Island in the center of the lake. It boats many modern hotels and facilities for water sports such as a boating water skiing and swimming. In West Sumatra, the center of culture and tourism is Bukit Tinggi, situated in the highlands north of the provincial capital of Padang. West Sumatra is a land of scenic beauty with green lakes and blue mountains. Java has a great number of attractions, including the world-renowned botanic garden in Bogor, the wildlife reserve of Ujung Kulin on the southwest part of the island. Boro Budur, a gigantic Buddhist shrine is situated 42 kilometers northwest of Yogyakarta and the Ijin crater lies in East Java and displays hot springs, waterfalls and free-roaming deer as well as a sulfur crater. A three-hour drive from Surabaya, and the Aponi ride from the village of Nadasari over the sea will take you to Mount Bromo which is an active volcano with sulfur fumes and smoke still emitting from its depths. The inhabitants of the surrounding areas believe in the god of Bromo and bring offerings to his deity. Bali is different from the rest of Indonesia because of its unique form of Hinduism called Hindu Dharma. Religion is at the main source of traditional custom in family and community life. The soul of a Balinese if religion and it finds its expression in art. Many articles and books have been written on Bali. Polar Bear Polar bear are adapted to life in the polar region, around the North Pole. Their bodies have special features that work particularly well in the polar seas. For instance, they have sharp and powerful claws for catching their food, which is mainly seals. In their own environment, they are excellent hunter, but if they had to live on the birds and squirrels in other places, they would die. The science that studies the way that different forms of life are adapted to their particular environment is called ecology. The first lesson of ecology is that all life in an environment depends on other forms of life. Polar bears depend on seals, which can live only where they do because they depend on particular kinds of fish which are found in the Arctic seas. There are certain important cycles in nature that show plants and animals depend on each other. For example, the nitrogen cycles. Plants take nitrogen compounds from the soil and turn them into protein. Animals eat these proteins and return some of them to the soil as waste products and the rest when they die. Another cycle is the oxygen cycle. When we breathe, we take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide. Plants absorb it to make sugar compounds, and in the process oxygen is produced and released to the atmosphere. An ideal ecological system, living things exist in balance. However, particularly where man interferes, a species may become too successful and abundant, and the balance is destroyed. For instance, the use of pesticides to kill a particular plant pest may also kill predatory insects and even birds, and thus other pests are allowed to increase. Therefore, great care is needed in the use of pesticides. 
Through ecology we try to restore the balance in the ecological system, and thus save the world from devastation. Bank Card Many people now have a card which enables them to withdraw money from a cash dispenser. You feed your card into the machine and key in your PIN, personnel identification number, and the amount of money you want if you have enough in your account, the money requested will be issued to you up to a dairy limit. Your account is automatically debited for the amount you have drawn. Provided you have a sound credit, you can get a credit card from a bank and other financial institutions. To obtain goods or services, you present your card and sign a special voucher. When it receives the voucher, the credit card company pays the trader, less a commission, and then sends you a monthly statement. Depending on the type of card you have, you will either have to pay in full or be able to pay part of what is owed and pay interest on the balance, left outstanding. If you need to make fixed payments at regular intervals, example for insurance premiums, you can arrange a standing order, sometimes known as a banker's order, so that the bank will do this for you. Farming The average person will say, had agriculture means farming. He wants partly right, for raising crops is a branch of agriculture. So do livestock raising, dairy farming, fruit growing, chicken raising and even fur farming. Agriculture includes the raising of every kind of plants and animals that is useful to man. With all its many branches, agriculture is the world's most important industry. It supplies the food we eat and many of the materials from which we make our clothing. Farms are classified according to the type of farming that is done and kinds of crops and livestock that are raised. They may be classified in several different ways such as general, specialized, intensive, and extensive farms. General farming is a farm where a variety of things is raised. On such a farm there may be a herd of dairy cows whose milk the farmer sells. There may also be poultry to provide extra income and supply some of the family's needs. There are aft many factors that influence the types of crops and livestock that a farmer raised. The most important one is climate which includes temperature, length of growing season, sunshine, and rainfall. Another is the type of soil. The third is the amount of water available of irrigation. By concentrating on the particular crops or animals that fit best with this situation, the specialized farmer hopes to use his land in the most efficient and profitable way. When a farmer devotes a great deal of labor to a piece of land, he is practicing intensive agriculture. If he works in a large area of land with relatively little labor, he is practicing extensive agriculture. Intensive agriculture usually goes together with small farms. A great deal of careful work is always involved in intensive agriculture. Often this work must be done by hand. Extensive agriculture is usually practiced on large farms or ranches where most of the work is done by machinery. Planet A planet is a body in space that revolves around a star. There are nine planets in our solar system, and these nine planets travel around the sun. The names of the planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Planets travel in orbit, around the stars. All of the planets of the solar system revolve in elliptical orbits. In other words, their orbits are like large, flat circles. The time that it takes a planet to make one revolution around the sun is called a year. The Greeks were the first people to recognize and give names to some of the planets. The word planet comes from a Greek word meaning wanderer. If a person wanders, tills means that he goes from one place to another and does not have a home. The Greeks thought that planets wandered in the sky. However, modern scientists can predict the movement of the planets very accurately. Dear Rosa, I am a guy, 28 years old. I have a problem with a girlfriend. She is 25 years old. We have been dating each other for years 
since we were high school students. Now we have jobs. I feel very sure that we love each other. Now it is time for me to get married. Unfortunately, her parents never approve of our relationship ever since the very first time. My family, anyhow, does not really mind. At first I thought my girlfriend had the power to defend our love. But then she surrendered. She loves me and she loves her family, too. On the one hand she said, I'll be happy if my family is happy. It means she had to get approval from her parents. For this I was shocked. My heart was broken. She ended our relationship just at the time when I was ready to marry her. When I was with her, we were very happy. We had a lot in common and there were no conflicts. The truth was, we separated only because of her parents. They want her to marry her cousin, her aunt's son, this is one of the traditions in the Coronis. For the time being I am very upset. When I miss her I call her. Then we can eat together, talk together for hours. We act like elating because she loves me, too. The real problem is, she cannot refuse what her parents want. So, should I forget my girlfriend, the only one that I truly love? Or else, should I just wait, and dream that one day she will be back to me? Rio N. Padang Dear Rio You call her your girlfriend, but she has chosen her own way. For this reason I, say that there is nothing you can do except forget her and go on with your normal life. Hopefully you can find another and live happily forever. Rosa Gunning Tuju Lake Gunning Tuju Lake is one of the many lakes in Kabu Padankaran Sea in Jambi Province. It is an amazing tourist place to visit. The location of Gunning Tuju Lake is in Kekamadan Kayu Aro. It is about 50 kilometers from Sungai Penyu to Pelampik Village by public transport. Then people climb and walk for another 4 kilometers or for 2.5 hours. The lake is surrounded by steep forest slopes and seven mountains. The highest peak of Gunning Tuju Lake is 1,950 meters above sea level. The length of the lake is 4, 5 kilometers and the width is 3 kilometers. It is a volcanic lake and the highest in Southeast Asia. The temperature around the lake is very cold. Besides waterfalls you can also find animals such as Siamang, elephants and birds. Gunning Tuju Lake is really beautiful with a spectacular scenery. Floating Market The market is called a floating market because the trade takes place on boats in Indonesia they are called Klatak and Juking. This market has existed for over 400 years. In the past, people from inland areas brought their agricultural produce or handicrafts to sell. They bartered with people from the coastal areas. Nowadays people can buy things such as fruit, vegetables, traditional cakes and even clothes from this, Pasar Terapung. Another unique feature of these markets is the time of trading. It begins around 5 a.m. and finishes at 9 a.m. University of Cambridge. Do you plan to study abroad? Don't hesitate. Welcome to Cambridge University. Cambridge University, an institution of higher education, is the second oldest university in Great Britain after the University of Oxford. It is located in the city of Cambridge. The University of Cambridge is a system of faculties, departments, and 31 independent colleges. You know, although the colleges and the university per se are separate corporations, all are parts of an integrated educational entity. The university examines candidates for degrees during their residencies and at the conclusion of their studies. The colleges provide their students with lodgings and meals, assign tutors, and offer social, cultural, and athletic activities. Every student at the University of Cambridge is a member of a college. Let's see its academic year. The academic year is divided into three terms of approximately eight weeks each. Michaelmas, Autumn, Lent, Late Winter, and Easter, Spring.
Students required to study under supervisor are usually members of the college's faculties who maintain close relationships with small groups of students in their charge and assist them in preparing for university exams. Chocolate. Have you ever wondered how people get chocolate from? In this article we'll enter the amazing world of chocolate so you can understand exactly what you're eating. Chocolate starts with a tree called the cacao tree. This tree grows in equatorial regions, especially in places such as South America, Africa, and Indonesia. The cacao tree produces a fruit about the size of a small pineapple. Inside the fruit are the tree's seeds, also known as cocoa beans. The beans are fermented for about a week, dried in the sun and then shipped to the chocolate maker. The chocolate maker starts by roasting the beans to bring out the flavor. Different beans from different places have different qualities and flavor, so they are often sorted and blended to produce a distinctive mix. Next, the roasted beans are winnowed. Winnowing removes the meat nib of the cacao bean from its shell. Then, the nibs are blended. The blended nibs are ground to make it a liquid. The liquid is called chocolate liquor. It tastes bitter. All seeds contain some amount of fat, and cacao beans are not different. However, cacao beans are half fat, which is why the ground nibs form liquid. It's pure bitter chocolate. My evening. One evening I went out with my friend Yatno for a dinner in a restaurant. We went home at 9.30 and I offered to take Yatno's home. We were driving along, when suddenly a car drove very fast out of control. The car crashed and after that it burst into flames. Hurriedly we ran to the burning car. We saw three people trapped inside. They were screaming and we had to get them out. It was incredibly hot when we opened the doors. The driver was sitting inside, unconscious. We got him out and then went back for the other two people. I had to climb over the front seats to get to them. Surprisingly, they were able to walk away from the car. Meanwhile, some people who were watching from nearby campsite, called emergency services. My unforgettable experience. I had one unforgettable experience. It happened when I was in high school. It was on my birthday. One day, I was called for a meeting. All teachers and my friends were scowling at me. The teachers even punished me and asked me to stand on a chair with my eyes closed in the middle of the schoolyard. I had no idea why they were being so cruel to me. I was so sad that I couldn't help crying. Then suddenly, I heard my teachers and friends saying, Happy Birthday. After that, they showered me with water until I was soaking wet. Next, they took me to my class. My classmates congratulates me and gave me presents. I was very surprised. I will never forget that moment. My holiday. Last week I went to East Java for holiday. I stayed at my uncle's house at Simara Luang, Probolingo. It has a big garden with lots of colorful flowers and a fish pond. On the first day I went to Mount Bromo. The next day my aunt, my uncle and I saw Gunning Batak and went on scenic ride on horseback. It was scary. Then we went to get a closer look at the mountain. We took a picture of beautiful scenery there. On the last day we went to the zoo at Wanakromo. There were many kinds of animals. We saw cockatoos having shower. In the afternoon we went back to Depak, my home. It was really tiring but very fun. Went to a store. Last week, I and my dad went to a store. We went there to buy some candies. In the store, the candies looked so good. I would have bought a lot of them but my dad said I could only have three. I gave the store owner the money for the candies. As we left the store, I ate one of the candies. It was yummy. I hope we come back soon. Dear Meliani, JL, Timur Pond No. 45 Jakarta on my last school holiday, my classmates and I went to Borobudur. The Borobudur temple is really magnificent. The hugeness of the temple really impressed me. How could our ancestors build such a big temple? It was amazing. 
In the temple, we went upstairs step by step. Walking around the temple, we saw many reliefs on the temple walls. Some foreigners seemed interested in them. I overheard their conversation with the guide. Actually, the reliefs tell a story. It was really a nice experience. I hope you can go there someday. Love. Rennie. Two students were discussing the schools. Two students were discussing the school's new rule that all the students must wear a cap and a tie one of them showed her annoyance. She said that wearing a cap and a tie was only suitable for a flag rising ceremony. So, she was against the rule. Contrary to the girl's opinion, the other student was glad with it. He said that he didn't mind with the new rule because wearing a cap and a tie will make the students look great and like real educated persons. The first student gave the reasons that they would feel uncomfortable and hot. Moreover, the classrooms were not air-conditioned. The second said it wasn't a big problem. He was sure that the students would wear them proudly. They would surely be used to it anyway. Elephant An elephant is the largest and strongest of all animals. It is a strange-looking animal with its thick legs, huge sides and backs, large hanging ears, a small tail, little eyes, long white tusks and above all it has a long nose, the trunk. The trunk is the elephant's peculiar feature, and it has various uses. The elephant draws up water by its trunk and can squirt it all over its body like a shower bath. It can also lift leaves and puts them into its mouth. In fact the trunk serves the elephant as a long arm and hand. An elephant looks very clumsy and heavy and yet it can move very quickly. The elephant is a very intelligent animal. Its intelligence combined with its great strength makes it a very useful servant to man and it can be trained to serve in various ways such as carry heavy loads, hunt for tigers and even fight. Gunning Tuju Lake Gunning Tuju Lake is one of the many lakes in Kabu Padankaran Sea in Jambi Province. It is an amazing tourist place to visit. The location of Gunning Tuju Lake is in Kekamadan Kayu Aro. It is about 50 kilometers from Sungai Penyu to Pelampik village by public transport. Then people climb and walk for another 4 kilometers or for 2.5 hours. The lake is surrounded by steep forest slopes and seven mountains. The highest peak of Gunning Tuju Lake runs 1,950 meters above sea level. The length of the lake is 4. 5 kilometers and the width is 3 kilometers. It is a volcanic lake and the highest in Southeast Asia. The temperature around the lake is very cold. Besides waterfalls you can also find animals such as Siamang, elephants and birds. Gunning Tuju Lake is really beautiful with a spectacular scenery. Employment of Indonesian Women the increasing employment of Indonesian women workers comes mostly from middle and upper income families. This is because many of them have got higher education. Today more than half of all women college graduates are employed, compared to four out often high school graduates, three out often elementary school graduates, and only two out often among those with less than grade five in school. Most of the working girls in the 1980s were unskilled, but today's working women have considerably more education than those who do not work. Among the working women only three-fourths are high school graduates and less than 10% have not been to high school at all. Most well-educated middle-class working women hold white-collar or professional jobs. Although many other kinds of work are offered to college-graduated women, clerical work and teaching are mostly preferred. About three-fifths of the girls who are graduated from high schools take clerical jobs. Agriculture The average person will say, had agriculture means farming. He is partly right, for raising crops is a branch of agriculture. So do livestock raising, dairy farming, fruit growing, chicken raising and even fur farming. Agriculture includes the raising of every kind of plants and animals that is useful to man. With all its many branches, agriculture is the world's most important industry.
It supplies the food we eat and many of the materials from which we make our clothing. Farms are classified according to the type of farming that is done and kinds of crops and livestock that are raised. They may be classified in several different ways, such as general, specialized, intensive, and extensive farms. General farming is a farm where a variety of things is raised. On such a farm there may be a herd of dairy cows whose milk the farmer sells. There may also be poultry to provide extra income and supply some of the family's needs. There are aft many factors that influence the types of crops and livestock that a farmer raised. The most important one is climate which includes temperature, length of growing season, sunshine, and rainfall, another is the type of soil. The third is the amount of water available of irrigation. By concentrating on the particular crops or animals that fit best with this situation, the specialized farmer hopes to use his land in the most efficient and profitable way. When a farmer devotes a great deal of labor to a piece of land, he is practicing intensive agriculture. If he works in a large area of land with relatively little labor, he is practicing extensive agriculture. Intensive agriculture usually goes together with small farms. A great deal of careful work is always involved in intensive agriculture. Often this work must be done by hand. Extensive agriculture is usually practiced on large farms or ranches where most of the work is done by machinery. Polar Bear Polar bear are adapted to life in the polar region, around the North Pole. Their bodies have special features that work particularly well in the polar seas. For instance, they have sharp and powerful claws for catching their food, which is mainly seals. In their own environment, they are excellent hunter, but if they had to live on the birds and squirrels in other places, they would die. The science that studies the way that different forms of life are adapted to their particular environment is called ecology. The first lesson of ecology is that all life in an environment depends on other forms of life. Polar bears depend on seals, which can live only where they do because they depend on particular kinds of fish which are found in the Arctic seas. There are certain important cycles in nature that show plants and animals depend on each other. For example, the nitrogen cycles. Plants take nitrogen compounds from the soil and turn them into protein. Animals eat these proteins and return some of them to the soil as waste products and the rest when they die. Another cycle is the oxygen cycle. When we breathe, we take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide. Plants absorb it to make sugar compounds, and in the process oxygen is produced and released to the atmosphere. An ideal ecological system, living things exist in balance. However, particularly where man interferes, a species may become too successful and abundant, and the balance is destroyed. For instance, the use of pesticides to kill a particular plant pest may also kill predatory insects and even birds, and thus other pests are allowed to increase. Therefore, great care is needed in the use of pesticides. Through ecology we try to restore the balance in the ecological system, and thus save the world from devastation. Plants and Animals Living in the Sea There are millions of plants and animals living in the sea. Most of the plants and animals living in the oceans are extremely small and float near the surface of the water in their thousands. They are food for huge numbers of small animals that also live near the surface. Together, they are all known as plankton. Many fish feed on this plankton, including one of the largest, the whale shark. Despite their great size, certain whales live entirely on plankton. The blue whale is the largest animal ever to live. It grows to a length of over 100 feet. The humpback whale is a smaller kind and has long flippers. It can jump right out the water. The Californian gray whale makes long migrations every year. It spends the summer feeding in the Arctic but swims south to the warmer waters off the coast of Mexico in the winter. The females give birth in the shallow, warm water there. 
Many of the fish in the sea may be eaten by other meat eaters. Sharks, for example, are some of the fastest hunters, although not all of them eat other fish. Deep down in the oceans live many strange fish. It is so dark down there that many of these fish have light on them, which are used for attracting smaller fish for the larger ones to eat. Jellyfish are peculiar looking creatures ranging in size from a fraction of an inch to six feet across. They don't really swim but drift in the currents of the open oceans. Although they contain a powerful sting, they are often eaten by turtles. Turtles are reptiles that spend most of their eggs on sandy beaches. The sun pour plenty of energy down on the earth. The sun pour plenty of energy down on the earth, and many homes now use this energy to heat their water. It is difficult and expensive to trap solar energy on a large scale but in some sunny part of the world scientists use mirrors to reflect sunlight into a boiler on top of a tower. This heats up water in the boiler into steam, which can then be used to turn electric generators. Many countries now have nuclear power stations. These use a rare metal called uranium as a kind of fuel. Under certain conditions, the nucleus center of uranium atoms can be made of split. This is called fission. When this happens, fantastic amount of energy is given out. The heat produced in a nuclear reactor is taken away by cooling liquid or gas. It goes to a boiler where it boils water to produce steam. The hot steam powers electric generators to make electricity. One of the main drawbacks with a nuclear power station is that it produces dangerous waste. It is dangerous because it gives out radiation rays that can harm most living things. Nuclear engineers have to make very sure that none of the radiation escapes either from the reactor, where fission takes place, or from the waste. A magazine A magazine is a periodical containing a variety of articles and general illustration of an entertaining or an instructive nature. Magazines are designed to be of interest either to the general public or groups of people with specialized subject matters. The essential difference between the magazine and the newspaper is a physical one. The magazine is smaller in size and often bound in pamphlet form. Magazine production involves teamwork. This means that many people have to work together to produce the magazine you have in your hand. But one key person is the magazine editor. If someone has a manuscript he wants to publish, he will send or submit it to the editor of the magazine he likes. The magazine editor, usually the editor-in-chief, will read it and make recommendations so that the manuscript can be published. Another task of a magazine editor is to consider whether the article will be part of series. Will it have photographs or illustration? Will it be in full color, two or three colors, or black and white? Once the decision is made, the work of an illustrator or photographer begins. Preparing manuscripts for the magazine is hard work to do. After everything is all right, they are sent to the typesetters. When the galleys or typeset text come back, they must be carefully read. This is the job of a proofreader to find out whether or not there are mistakes in typesetting. Corrections are made if there are mistakes. Wholesaling Wholesaling is part of the marketing system which provides channels of distribution that are used to bring goods to market. Most manufactured consumer goods are marketed through an indirect channel. This might be from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to the retailer to the consumer, or through more complicated channels. However, in general, wholesalers deal in products that are to be resold by retailers to consumers. Wholesaling is mostly a field of small business, although there is a growing chain movement in the United States. About a quarter of wholesaling units account for one-third of total sales. Two-thirds of the wholesaling middlemen are merchant wholesalers who take title to the goods they deal in. There are also agent middlemen who negotiate purchases or sales or both, but they don't take title to the goods they deal in. They sometimes take possession. Though, these agents don't earn salaries. 
They receive commissions. This is a percentage of the value of the goods they sell. Wholesalers simplify the process of distribution. For example, the average supermarket stocks 5.00 items in groceries alone. A retail druggist may have more than 6.00 items. Since a wholesaler handles a large assortment of items from numerous manufacturers, he greatly reduces the problem of both manufacturer and retailer. The storekeeper does not have to deal directly with thousands of different people. He may have a well-stocked store and deal with only a few wholesalers. The American Cancer Society The American Cancer Society has announced a sweeping revision in the cancer detection tests. The new guidelines, intended only are people who have no symptoms of cancer, or who are not considered to heat high risk, are designed to deliver essentially the same health benefit as previous society recommendations at greatly reduced cost, risk and inconvenience to the patient, says Dr. Salby Gusberg, president of the Society and Gynecologist at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. The Society, for example, no longer recommends an annual chest x-ray and sputum test for cigarette smokers and others who might incur lung cancer. Thus far, these tests have not been shown to increase a patient's chances of surviving lung cancer, even though they may detect the disease in its early stages. The annual pap smear is changed to at least once every three years, after two initial negative tests a year apart. For all women between 20 to 65 years old and for younger women who are sexually active, it usually takes many years to develop cervical cancer from precancerous lesions. Thus, an annual test to detect abnormalities of the cervix is not necessary for most women. Other new recommendations include a proctosigmoidoscopic examination for colon rectal cancer every there to five years for those over 50, a breast examination every three years for women under 40, an annual mammogram for women over 50, a single, baseline, mammogram for women between 35 and 40 and as often as advised by a personal physician for those under 50. Television Television has a great influence on our ideas about what is right and wrong about the way we should behave, and about life in general. Sometimes the values and lifestyles that we get from television are in conflict with those that are taught at home and, at school. Critics of television point out that crime and western programs often appeal to a taste of violence, while many games show appear to greed. Many critics also believe that television, should be used for socially constructive purposes as well as for entertainment. The first commercial television broadcast was made in April 20, 1939 by Radio Corporation of America RCA. Since 1939, it has become one of the most important facts of modern life. Television is very much part of the modern world. Its effects are felt all over the world. Television is a reflection of the modern world, say some people. It shows contemporary society. It affects customs and culture, others say. Television is bad for culture because it keeps culture from growing, say still others. Good or bad, television is difficult to avoid. Its pictures enter homes, stores, airports, and factories. It is here to stay. Organisms. In any community the various organisms are linked in a complicated web of relationships. These are usually in balance with one another. If the natural web is disturbed, the result may be disastrous. As a rule, the various populations of five organisms tend to adjust to seasonal and other changes, and the whole community stays in balance. Ironically, most disturbances come from man's activities. In an undisturbed forest, white-tailed deer feed on plants of various kinds. Wolves and mountain lions prey on the deer. When deer are very numerous, their enemies become numerous too, because there is so much to feed upon. The deer and their enemies stay in balance with one another. 
The man enters the scene. He considers animals such as wolves and mountain lions harmful. He kills as many animals as possible. When the animals that feed on deer are killed, the deer multiply, without check. Soon the large deer population has eaten nearly all the plants available for food. Then the deer begin to starve. Another example of man's interference with natural communities is the use of chemical insecticides. Grass in the sprayed areas may be eaten by cows. As a result, the milk of some cows has been found to contain too much DDT. The insecticides also collect in the tissues of birds that eat the sprayed insects. Some of the affected birds produce eggs that do not hatch. The number of birds decreases, cutting down the food supply of other animal. The banking system. A bank is an institution with a twofold function. First, it keeps people's money safe and readily available. In this way it functions as a savings bank. Secondly, it lends money to people who need it. It is also, therefore, a money lender. Anyone can go to any bank and deposit money, that is, ask the bank to look after it. He becomes a customer of the bank. When, he deposits money, we say he opens a bank account. There are two types of bank accounts. The first is a current account. When a customer deposits money on a current account, he can make withdrawals by means of a check. No interest is paid on this type. The other type of account is a time deposit. On this type of account the customer can deposits his money for a specified period of time he can withdraw the money only at the maturity date. Interest is paid for this type of account. A bank receives deposits from customers, as well as lend money to its customers. A person who wants to borrow money has to give the bank something as collateral for instance, a certificate showing ownership of property. When a customer has a bank loan, the bank charges him interest on the money he has borrowed. The bank does not always give the borrower actual money. It may credit his account with the amount borrowed, exactly as if he had deposited that amount at the bank. An accountant is a person who has charge of the accounts of a company. He is the one who records, keeps financial accounts and makes financial statements. He plays an important role to make the firms remain in good financial condition. A secretary is someone who keeps records, handles correspondence, or does the administration for an organization or person. The assistant or private secretary of an executive always deals with the business letter writing of that person. The secretary is, therefore, concerned with any business that the firm undertakes. The secretary must be qualified and able to speak English fluently. There are certain types of duties that a secretary is responsible of such as making appointments, receiving orders, making reservations for the manager, sending letters of congratulations or condolence, sending invitations etc. She also makes an agenda for the manager. An office usually has more than one secretary who are always busy doing their duties. Wildlife Conversation There is reason for the deepest concern about the plight of wildlife in our country. Many rare species are threatened with extinction because of the greed of hunters and game collectors. Orangutans are rarely found in their natural habitat in the forests of Kalimantan and Sumatra, but one may find them in zoos and private menageries all over the world. Ruthless hunters kill innocent elephants for their valuable ivory tusks or catch them alive to perform in circuses. Tigers hides decorate walls and floors of rich people's home in distant countries. If things are allowed to continue in this way it is feared that very soon all wildlife will disappear from our forests. Fortunately, the government has now imposed strict laws on hunting some areas or designated wildlife reserves where hunters cannot enter. These include Ujungkulan and Pangandaran in West Java, Marubadiri in East Java, and many more in the other islands. Some time ago our newspaper contained reports of elephants which had run amok in the province of Lampung. 
They had emerged from their abode in the forest and destroyed crops and houses belonging to the villagers. The people could not understand why the beasts had suddenly gone wild. The strange thing was that the animals had not come for food, because having wrought destruction they returned to the forest. They seemed to have come only to vent their anger. As elephants are protected by law, the people could not kill any of them. The explanation for the elephant's strange behavior is that they felt quiet life had been disturbed by the timber telling projects and sawmills set up deep in the forest. The animals felt their domain was being narrowed by man, and so they got angry. Elephants felt their domain was being narrowed by man, and so they got angry. Elephants need peace and quiet for their family life. They also need vast areas of land in which to roam. They live in herds, and each herd likes to have its own territory. Now the government has driven the elephants back into the forests, away from any village or lumber mill. By shouting and shooting in the air the people drove the great beasts to a do abode in the district of Air Sugihan. It is hoped that they will feel at home there, and can live in peace and quiet. Air Pollution Every day both industrial and domestic chimneys emit vast amounts of dirt and harmful gases. The exhaust fumes from thousands of car engines add to this huge volume of filth. Sulfur dioxide, produced mainly by the burning of coal and oil, combines with the moisture of the air to form sulfuric acid. This eats away stone, brick and even metal. Doctors reason that if it can do this, it must damage the lungs of people who breathe it, especially over a period of many years. Usually the effects of air pollution are not instantly noticeable. Occasionally, though, there have been catastrophic smogs. The word smog is a combination of smoke and fog. One of these occurred in the town of Denora, Pennsylvania, in the USA. The valley in which the town lies traps the smoke and fumes from the steelworks and chemical plants that fill it. One day, in October 1948, unusual weather conditions prevented the smog from lifting by the afternoon, as it normally did. Instead, it hung over the town for three days. By the end of the third day, nearly 6,000 people were ill. More than 60% of those aged 65 and over were seriously ill. 20 people died. At last a heavy rain shower cleared the smog. One of the chief causes of air pollution in many cities is the internal combustion engine. Cars, lorries, and buses give out the gas called carbon monoxide, which in high concentrations can kill a person in a confined space. Cars also throw into the air fine particles of rubber and asphalt from their tires in the road, and particles of asbestos from their brake linings. These can cause damage to the lungs when breathed in. Another source of pollution is nuclear power station which produce a great amount of poisonous radioactive waste. This waste must be sealed up and buried beneath the ground or seabed so carefully that there is no danger of leakage. Some scientists are very worried that we are not being careful enough with nuclear waste. It may not all be buried safely. Also, they fear there may be a serious accident at a nuclear. Volcanoes In Indonesia, mud flows have been the major cause of destruction and loss of human life during volcanic catastrophes and landslides. Another kind of disaster which claimed victims but which was not directly, caused by volcanic eruptions, happened at the Dion Plateau, Central Java, February 1979. Two mud eruptions and poisonous, suffocating gases caused the death 149 people. Disasters in the past may have been caused, by ground movement and tectonic earthquakes which are often inherent in volcanic outbursts. Examples of these are the earthquakes in Bali in 1963, which took place after the eruption of the Aging Volcano, and the earthquakes in West Java in the 1960s, caused by the Salak Volcano. So far, a direct relationship between tectonic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions has not been observed. 
Tectonic earthquakes may also be the cause of tsunamis. This phenomenon occurred during the Krakatau catastrophe in 1883, and caused the death of the people living in the coastal areas of South Sumatra and the western part of West Java. Most geologists, however, accepted the theory that this earthquakes was caused by sea waves, which in turn were the result of the collapse of the Krakatau volcano into the sea. This explosion was one of the most violent eruptions in historic times, and its collapse formed a caldera on the seabed. The menace of volcanoes in general is greater than that of other natural disasters. If an eruption occurred in the Toba region, for example, where flammable deposits are found in great quantity, it would entail a catastrophe. In such cases man is powerless. Volcanic eruptions besides claiming thousands of lives and causing lose of property and damage to villages, are, on the other hand, beneficial to agriculture. The ash they produce is responsible for the fertile soil around active volcanoes. Volcanoes, with their craters, lakes and solfataras are places of interest for local as well as foreign tourists. Volcanic rock is used in the manufacture of building materials, and volcanic heat is capable of generating electricity. The hospital. If you look at the front of a large modern hospital, you may notice that there are two separate entrances. One of these is for patients in need of immediate treatment. It is the emergency entrance. Here ambulance arc to be seen pulling up at any hour of the day or night. The other entrance is the main entrance of the hospital. On the ground floor. Inside the main entrance there are probably a reception area and waiting room, and also an office. On the floors above and below are the numerous other departments. On a lower floor may be the laundry and the kitchen. On another floor will be a maternity section for mothers and their babies. Their hospital, so that babies do not catch other people's illnesses. The rooms for other patients are usually on the higher floors. There are small room for just one patient, slightly larger room for two, three or four patients, and larger rooms called wards, in which as many as 40 or 50 patients may lie in rows of beds. On other floors are the operating rooms, called operating theaters, and special departments such as the radiography department, where x-rays are taken and developed. In the laboratories, Special tests are carried out on body tissues and fluids to find out the nature of a patient's disease. The pharmacy supplies the drug to treat patients. Near to the operating theaters is the blood bank to store blood for transfusions. Here too is the sterilizing department, where all the operating theaters and in the wards are cleaned and made free from germs. A very large staff is needed to run a hospital efficiently it consists of people who work together in teams. The hospital administrators organize the day-to-day -day working of the hospital. The medical staff, including the doctors and nurses, work directly with the patients. So too do such people as the physiotherapists, anesthetists and radiographers. Grouped together, these people are sometimes known as paramedical workers. Oil. Oil, like coal and natural gas, is a fossil. Fuel fossils are made from the remains of dead plants and animals. It is thought that oil comes from tiny plants and animals whose bodies fell in their millions to the seabed when they died. There they were covered by sand and mud, which later hardened into rocks. In the course of millions of years, the plant and animal materials underwent chemical changes and eventually turned into oil. Oil deposits lie hidden deep beneath the surface of Earth. They have to be searched for. Unless the oil actually comes to the surface, it is impossible to be certain that any is present. The during demand for oil products keeps the oil companies busy exploring new oil fields and drilling new wells. Exploration teams are sent to distant regions to search for oil. If the exploration shows good results, the company decides to drill a well. Thus the exploration phase ends, and the production phase begins. 
At the beginning of the production phase, gas pressure from below causes the crude oil to gush to the surface with great force. After some time, however, the gas pressure is less, and a pumping station must be built to bring up the oil. Wells continue to produce oil for several years, until productions become so tow that must be abandoned. Crude oil has to be transported to a refinery to be made into the many products that are useful to man, such as petrol, kerosene, diesel oil, lubricants, asphalt. Further, processing gives aviation fuel, greases, fertilizers, insecticides, man-made fibers and many other things. The oil industry has a very complex and widespread distribution system. Ocean tankers, pipelines, rail tankers, and road tankers are used to bring the oil products to seaports, inland depths, cannon drum factories, and to tent of thousands of petrol stations in cities and along motorways. More than any other, the oil industry influences the lives of men and women everywhere. From the largest to the simplest home, whose need may only be kerosene for its lamps and stoves. A volcano. A volcano is mountain surrounding is the Earth's crust. Steam, gases, lava, ashes, etc. are forced out almost continuously from an active volcano. A dormant volcano is a little different. The steam gases lava, ashes, etc. are forced out along intervals. In an extinct volcano, the opening or crater has long been closed up with cold, solid lava, etc. There is no heat left. Volcanic eruptions cause disaster. Hot materials that are thrown up destroy all life in their path. Hot lava, when cooled off, turns into cold. Lahar, which becomes dangerous when it rains. Eruptions are accompanied by earthquakes, sometimes very destructive as when Mount Aging erupted in 1963. One may conclude that volcanoes only cause disasters. This is not true. In fact, they are also a great blessing. Volcanoes and mountains, in general, force the clouds to rise. While rising they cool off and drop the water they contain in the form of rain. The materials thrown up by volcanoes contain minerals that are needed by plants. After many years volcanic materials will turn into good soil. Volcanic soil, being very fertile because of the minerals it contains, is very good farmland. The higher regions, being cool or good for coffee, tea, and other plantations, requiring a cool climate. The woods on the slopes protect the soil against erosion, while the soil acts as a water reservoir giving water to the river. Henry Ford and Mass Production Many of you may have seen a Ford car. Some have owned one, or at least you might have owned one formerly Ford cars were popular in Indonesia, although today there are more Toyota and other Japanese cars than Ford or other American cars. Like the Toyota car, the Ford car is named after the man who started the car factory. Henry Ford, along with his friends, started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. It was a small company then, but by 1927 it had grown into a giant company. The great success of the company began during the years 1912 and 1913, when it applied all the element of mass production. The most modern machine tools were used. The parts of the car were standardized, machines and workers were placed in orderly sequence. Moving conveyor belts were used. Other devices were employed in order that the movement of the pasts and materials might be economical and efficient. All activities were planned and coordinated. Basically, that is what mass production is all about. The word, mass, means a large number. The term, mass production, refers to methods of organizing, production processes for a maximum number of products at the lowest cost. It is based on two general principles. One is the division and specialization of human labor. The other is this use of tools and machines in the production of standard, interchangeable parts. 
from the Ford Motor Company mass production spread to other companies. Many Ford become known as its creator. Was this creator of modern mass production a graduate of a famous university? No, he was not. He never studied at any university. He did not even finish high school. He left school when he was 15 and began to work. You might think that he ought to have finished his schooling first. Young Henry did not think so. Perhaps instead he thought that one could be successful without finishing his schooling. Young Henry Ford might have promised himself that he would be a successful man. If indeed he did, then he kept his word. He was a successful man, and his name will be remembered in the history of mass production for good. Water. People need water. We cannot live without water. Persons should drink at least eight glasses of water a day. If a person does not drink enough water, he can suffer from kidney trouble. A big man should drink more than eight glasses a day. In Indonesia many children die of dehydration. This means they die because of lack of water in their bodies. So we must make sure that our children drink enough water especially when they are suffering from diarrhea. At present, many governments of the world are worried about the water supplies in their countries. Fresh water is becoming more and more difficult to get. In many cities where there are many people, the level of water in the underground wells is getting lower and fewer. The loss of water from wells under the ground. These are very important for water preservation. Dams preserve or store the water that many of our towns and cities need. Dams have many functions. They hold back rainwater that may result in floods if not checked. They also provide water to irrigate the farms. People can use the waterfalls of a dam to produce electricity. Electricity gives light and energy to our houses and factories. Dams can also produce lakes, and lakes can be used for raising fish and for practicing various kinds of water sports. Another source of water is rivers. In Indonesia we have many rivers. Rivers are a good source of water. However, if people throw waste into rivers, then the water becomes very dirty. Waste pollutes water. One of the most dangerous types of waste is chemical waste from factories. This can be deadly and can kill fish, water plants and other creatures which live in rivers. The sun is a source of energy. As the supplies of fossil fuels coal, oil and gas are running out, scientists have been working hard trying to find ways of obtaining other kinds of fuel. They have succeeded in finding one that is very efficient, nuclear fuel, however, the ores which produce this in of energy, e.g. uranium ores, will eventually run out, too. Fortunately a source of abundant energy, which is virtually inexhaustible sunlight has been waiting for the scientist. The sun sends out energy equal to that produced by 10 million tons of coal every second, of which the earth receives only one two billionth part. It is estimated that the energy which falls no one square meter of the Earth's surface per second can be used to keep about 7 100 watt lamps burning. The sun's energy is really abundant, but only a limited amount has so far been used by man. The sun can also be used as a source of fuel for power plants. Such power plants are still in the experimental stages. However, it is hoped that they will lead the way to a wider use of solar energy to run machines. Solar energy can be used in telephone communications, space technology, and farming. Solar batteries have been in experimental use for a number of years to power telephone lines. They are now being used to recharge batteries which power instruments used in space vehicles. Scientists have also succeeded in developing solar pumps that can raise water for irrigation. The sun seems to be ideal source of energy for a great many uses. Yet to change the abundant sunlight into energy is a different matter. The instruments needed to catch the sun's energy are still very expensive. However, once man succeeds in catching even a small part of that energy, Nobody would worry about running out of fossil fuels or uranium ores.
It lines in the hands of the scientist to make this dream come true. Marine life. The word, marine, comes from the Latin word, mer, which means, sea. Marine life means all the animal and plant species that live in the waters of the sea. The geography of the seabed, the floor of the sea, is not so different from that of the land. There are hills, high mountains, valleys, rolling plains and plateaus. Below the low tide mark, the bottom of the sea slopes gently downward to a depth of about 100 fathoms, in the form of a shelf known as the continental shelf. On the surface of the sea there are tiny floating plants and animals, including the eggs and young of larger animal and jellyfishes that are called plankton. The plankton is important because a great many fishes feed on it. Several kinds of animals such as crabs, lobsters, shrimp, squids, octopuses, malusi, shellfish of all kinds, anemones and sponges live on the seashore. Such animal can also be found on the continental shelf, but the animals that live in the deeper waters are usually larger. Seaweeds live in the shallow waters, not deeper than 50 fathoms as they need fairly strong sunlight to assimilate their food. In China and Japan seaweeds are eaten. Ill Europe carrageen is used for thickening soup and making jellies. The really deep sea is cold and dark because the sunlight cannot penetrate the depths. The pressure in the deep sea higher than in the shallow water, and the fishes are much more fragile and delicate in appearance than those from parts of the sea where the pressure is lower. Some have large eyes and can see, but other are completely blind. We should look on the sea as a valuable source food. Fishing industries should know the location one of fish they are trying to catch, and how many can be caught without killing off the whole species. Spacecraft People had thought of building spacecraft several hundred years ago. They had thought of going to the moon and many other planets. Papers on spacecraft can be found among the papers of famous scientists who lived centuries ago. However, the craft could not be built until after World War II. It is not easy to build a spacecraft. A spacecraft needs a good rocket that is strong enough to send it to outer space. Such a motor was not developed until 1944. A spacecraft also needs as many as rent million very sophisticated parts. These parts are needed so that the craft can function well when it is flying far away from Earth. These parts must have very high precision elements. Each of them must have the right shape and the right size. Such parts could not be mowed until after 1940. Today, spacecraft are being made all the time. They have to be enough to carry astronauts into outer space. What does a spacecraft look like? A spacecraft usually consists of three rockets that are joined together. The three rockets are called stages. The first stage takes the spacecraft to a certain speed and then falls away. The second stage takes it to speed twice as great as the first, and then it also falls away. The third stage takes the spacecraft to its top speed of more than 38,600 km per hour. Where is the place for the astronauts? It is at the top of the spacecraft. In the nose of the third stage a capsule. In this capsule are the astronauts and the instrument package. This capsule is actually the smallest part of the ship. But all sorts of very sophisticated instruments are found into his capsule. This little capsule is the most important part of the ship. Wildlife Conversation There is reason for the deepest concern about the plight of wildlife in our country. Many rare species are threatened with extinction because of the greed of hunters' game collections. Orangutan are rarely found in their natural habitat in the forest of Kalimantan and Sumatra, but one may find them in zoo and private menageries all over the world. Ruthless hunters kill innocent elephants for their valuable ivory tusks, or catch them alive to perform in circuses. Tigers' hides decorate walls and floors of rich people's home in distant countries. If things are allowed to continue in this way, it is feared that very soon all wildlife will disappear from our forests.
Fortunately, the government has now imposed strict law on hunting. Some areas are designated wildlife reserves where hunters cannot enter. These include Ujungkulan and Pangandaran in West Java, Marubadiri in East Java, and many more in the other islands. Some time ago our newspapers contained reports of elephants which had run amok in the province of Lampung. They had emerged from their abode in the forest and destroyed crops and houses belonging to the villagers. The people could not understand why the beasts had suddenly gone wild. The strange thing was that the animals had not come for food, because having wrought destruction they returned to the forest. They seemed to have come only to vent their anger. As elephants are protected by law, the people could not kill any of them. The explanation for the elephants' strange behavior is that they felt their quiet life had been disturbed by the timber felling projects and saw mills set up deep in the forest. The animals felt their domain was being narrowed by man, and so they got angry. Elephants need peace and quiet for their family life. They also need vast areas of land in which to roam. They live in herds, and each herd likes to have its own territory. Now the government has driven the elephants back into the forests, away from any village or lumber mill. By shouting and shooting in the air the people drove the great beasts to a new abode in the district of Air Sudihan. It is hoped that they will feel at home there and can live in peace and quiet. Albert Einstein In 1894, when Albert Einstein was 15, his father lost money and could not support him any longer. Other boys would have left school and stopped studying. Not Albert. He left school for some time, but he later managed to go to a better school, the Polytechnic in Zurich, Switzerland. On leaving the institute he discovered that no one would offer him the kind of job he wanted. At last he found a suitable one at the patent office in Bern. Einstein's task at the patent office was to make an investigation of the new products sent to his office. The job did not require much of Einstein's new products sent to his office. The job did not require much of Einstein's time, so he was able to write scientific articles. He published these in 1905. Scientists were surprised by what he had written. They were even more surprised when they knew that these articles, when could have been written by a university professor, were actually written by an official at a patent office. Investigations were made and it was decided that the official should be taken from the patent office and given a more suitable job. A few years later, Einstein became a professor at the University of Zurich. In 1911 he taught in Prague and later at the Polytechnic Institute in Switzerland, where he had been a student. Then he was requested to move to Berlin. Einstein stayed in Berlin for 20 years, from 1913 to 1933. During that period he worked on his famous theory of relativity. He gave a simple example, in simple language, to explain the idea of relativity. A man riding on a train drops a stone out of the window, to the man on the train, it seems that the stone follows a straight path as it drops. However, to a man outside the train, the part of the stone does not seem straight, it looks like a parabola. The theory expands those of Newton and Galileo, which are correct, only under certain conditions. Einstein made very important contributions in the field of physics. The Nobel Prize that he won in 1912 at the of 42 was no surprise to the scientific world. No scientist beat him his field. What beat him was time. He died in Princeton in the USA in 1955. People believed that he was J the century's greatest man of science. Jakarta and other big cities In Jakarta and other big cities in Indonesia it is common practice to use gas for cooking. Gas reaches the houses through large underground pipes called gas mains, and smaller pipes called service pipes lead to the gas meters in each hose or building. The meter records how much gas is used. Natural and gas and gas from oil has no distinctive smell, 
so an artificial smell is produced by adding small quantities of concentrated adurants to enable people to detect any leak that may occur. Pertamina sells bottled gas under the name of LPG. The gas is put in steel drums or cylinders. Bottled gas is used by people who live places without a piped supply, by yachtsmen and campers. Indonesia's role in LNG production started in 1977 with the initiation of the LNG facility at Bontang. About a year later the plant at Arun also started production and exportation. Castor fuel and lye. The air we breathe contains the gases oxygen and nitrogen, and small quantities of other gases. Every gas consists of molecules of a particular substance, moving rapidly about. The molecules are comparatively far apart, but they fill evenly any vessel containing them. All gases can be changed to liquids, and some even to solids, if they are cooled down enough. The oxygen used in factories for making a very hot flame to cut and weld steel is sometimes stored and carried about in the liquid state and solid carbon dioxide, usually called dry ice, is used for keeping ice cream cold. The kinds of gases used in cookers and gas fires come from three sources. The first kind is made of naphtha, which is a light oil, the second is made from coal, while the third, natural gas, is almost entirely methane. Geologists believe that natural gas was produced iron carboniferous, or coal-bearing rocks. The gas rose into the rock holes in the sandstone, and was prevented from escaping upwards out of the sandstone by a cap, rock usually a from of rock salt which formed a dome over the natural reservoir of gas. Compulsory education and foster parents. In realization of the mission in the preamble of our constitution which urges us to raise the intelligence of nation, the government announced the beginning of a compulsory education program in Indonesia in a ceremony celebrating the Nation Education Day, on the 2nd of May 1984. The program was begun almost at the same time as the beginning of the fourth five-year development plan, 1984 to 1989. The program requires that children from 7 to 12 years age complete at least six years of primary education. With this compulsory education program, children of 7 to 12 years of age will have an equal opportunity to enjoy primary education throughout the country. On the occasion of celebration of International Children's Day, on the 23rd of July 1984, the government launched another scheme calling for well-to-do economically able person to become foster parent. The duty of a foster parent is to finance the children's education as well as to provide all basic requirements that the fostered children may need in their schooling such as nutritious food, school uniform and textbook. The help be given on the basic of the spirit of humanity. Once a foster parent agrees to finance a child's the foster parent should be prepared to do it at least for one years, although the ideal target is six years, that is, until the child finish his primary education. The foster parent may be an individual or a corporate body, like a foundation, social organization, business enterprise, or private social institution. The response to this scheme has been very good. Thousands of people have pledged to help finance the poor children or orphans. It is hoped that in the near future, through the compulsory education and foster parent program, the intelligence of the nation will be raised. Driving safely. Like many others that we do well, safe driving begins with simple matter. It begins as soon as you sit behind the steering wheel. The first things that you should do is to get the proper seating position and the proper distance between yourself and the steering wheel. You should sit down in such a way that your shoulders rest easily again the seat. Your back should also be against the seat, not hunched forward. Move the set until your arms are straight in front of you when holding the steering wheel. Of course, you are not going to drive with your hands in the top position but that is how you measure the proper distance. Make sure, 
however, that at that distance you can reach the foot pedals easily. Otherwise make the necessary adjustments to your seating position, for example by moving the seat forward bit. If it is your own car, it will be better and safer to have blocks installed on the pedals. At any rate, you should be able to sit comfortably bin the proper distance. The City of London The history of London cannot be separated from the River Thames. If you look at the map you will see that it is the gateway to London from the European continent. In the first century, when the Romans occupied England, there was a small village on Lud Hill along the Thames, where the river was at its lowest point. It was about 10 miles from the sea. The Romans discovered that they could load and unload their merchant ships here. So, they built a city on Lud Hill. More and more ships could now for either loading or unloading, bringing more and more business to the city. They called the city Londinium, meaning, city, from which the name London was probably derived. In order to connect both sides of the river, called the Thames, the Romans built the London Bridge here. A great fire in 1665 brought a big change to London. The great wall surrounding the city was destroyed and today we can only see its ruins. Another change was brought by the Second World War. From August 1940 to May 1941, German bombers attacked the city almost every night, destroying thousands of buildings arid houses, and killing thousands of people. For the second time, the greater part of London was in ruins. Government is endeavoring. The government is endeavoring to cope with the population problem in two ways. On the one hand by encouraging people to move, either spontaneously or under the official transmigration program from densely populated Java, Madura and Bali to the wider open spaces of the outer islands of Sumatera, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and Irian Jaya, and on other hand by fostering family planning. Transmigration is more than a response to population growth. It also carries profound implications for balanced national development and for national security. In its response to the population growth however, Indonesia must continue to rely upon family planning objectives, the establishment of happy and prosperous small families and the reduction of the population growth to 1% by 1990. The country's family planning can indeed offer valuable lessons for other parts of the world in terms not only of results achieved but also of the democratic way in which they have been achieved. Indonesia's family planning program has become one of the most remarkable of all attempts to institute birth control on a mass scale. Indonesia Having the world's fifth largest populations and endowed with extensive and varied natural resources, has the potential to become a great and prosperous power, but for the time being she is facing four main problems. How to cope with her population's growth, how to produce enough food, how to provide people with jobs and how to organize enough exports so that the country can pay her way in the world. Indonesia's most valuable resource is her people. But for Indonesia, as with other developing countries, the possession of this particular kind of resource can prove to be a serb impediment to economic development. Water Water is an essential component of all living matter. The body itself consists of more than 70% water. Water is necessary for weathering processes that convert rock to soil and for the transport of soil nutrients to plant. In the form of vapor, it provides protection for us against the harmful radiations from outer space and the chilling temperatures at night. Water is so much a part of our daily lives that we take all this for granted. We drink it, wash with it, use it to dispose of our waste products and for countless other domestic purposes. The widest use of water in some countries is for irrigation. The farmers grow rice extensively to satisfy the need for this staple food. With the programmer's priority being to increase rice production, the heavy use of water for agriculture will continue in the future. Water is also used to produce electric power. 
Many hydroelectric power plants provide electricity for cities, towns and villages. Industry depends on water. The manufacture of foodstuffs, textiles, man-made dams now attract more and more people for fishing, boating and other recreations. Water sources can be classified as either surface water or groundwater. Surface water originates from two main sources rivers and rainfall, which act as the sources of water in urban areas. Rainwater failing on land areas partly infiltrates the Earth's surface and is partly intercepted by plants, while some evaporates. Water collected in lakes, swamps, streams and rivers can be used to provide an urban water supply. Central Bank A central bank also provides loans to its customers. But the customers are not individuals as in the case of commercial bank. The customers of central banks are governments, other commercial banks and financial institutions, a country will have one central bank. In England it is the Bank of England. In our country it is the Bank of Indonesia. The central bank often has a duty of formulating and implementing the country's monetary and credit policies, usually in cooperation with the government. For us individuals, the commercial bank is more important because it directly provides us with services. We can enjoy the services by establishing an account at the bank. There are two kind of account. One is the savings account and the other is the current account. One advantage of having a current account is that we can pay using checks. This means that we don't have to carry large amounts of money with us and risk losing it. Most banks, commercial banks, have two kinds of current accounts. One is the minimum balance account and the other is the special account. The former kind requires the customer to maintain in his account a certain amount as a minimum balance. But the bank will charge the customer a fee for each check he or she writes. Volcano in Indonesia Probably the best known volcano in Indonesia, or in the whole world for that matter, is Mount Krakatau. It erupted violently in 1883. What caused it to erupt? Or, more generally, what causes volcanoes to erupt? In order to know the answer, it is necessary for us to know what a volcano is. In Indonesian we call it, Gunung Berapi, or, Gunung Api. For short, the question is, where do the heat and fire come from? According to geologists, deep beneath the ground there are chambers, which contain molten rock. Because of high pressure, the molten rock is forced up the passage that connects the chamber and the opening in the crust of the earth. This molten rock flows out of the opening as lava, magma, and along with it is emitted ashes and gases. A volcano, then, is a mountain with an opening at the top, from which flows lava. Hot ashes and gases eventually the lava cools off and becomes solid rock. Sometimes the solid rock blocks the opening and eruption stop. However, if high pressure builds up in the chamber, the blockage may reopen and the volcano erupts once more. Very often a volcanic explosion, like the 1883's explosion of Mount Krakatau, causes a great deal of human suffering. That is why people often associate volcanoes with disasters. That is not wholly correct, of course, since there are also some good things. Firstly, volcanoes, like mountain in generals, cause clouds the rise and then cool off to form rain. Secondly, the materials thrown up by volcanoes contain minerals needed by plants. After many years the volcanic materials make the soil fertile. Food Additives When we buy canned or bottled food products at the grocers or the supermarket, we will find out that there are some additives added to the main nutrients. An additives is a non-nutritive substance intentionally added to food generally in small quantities, to improve appearance, flavor, storage properties, etc. Most governments issue lists of permitted additives stating the highest acceptable concentration, defining food products in which they may be used and sometimes recommending the maximum daily consumption. 
Such legislation is revised periodically, and product may be added to or deleted from permitted lists because of additional scientific knowledge and experience of their use. A group of food additives includes vitamins, amino acids, and minerals which are added to foodstuffs to compensate for losses occurring during processing or to provide additional sources in diet that might otherwise be deficient in such nutrients. Examples of their use include enrichment of margarine with the addition of vitamin A, and niacin amide to flour or bread. Salt often has a small amount of iodine to it to avoid it a diet deficiency that can cause goiter development. Appearance is an important factor in food appeal, and legislation in most countries permits the addition of both natural and synthetic coloring matter based on the coloring standards issued by the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and World Health Organization, WHO. Flavoring materials are added to basic foodstuff to provide a characteristic product flavor or to supplement or modify the original flavor. Most flavoring materials are still of natural origin, but progress in organic chemistry has made it possible to analyze flavoring materials and to synthesize products similar with those found in nature. Flavor can also be influenced by the addition of the flavor enhancer such as monosodium glutamate which intensifies perception of flavoring. Oil. That oil has helped to shape the world is not an exaggeration. Indeed, the discovery of oil during the last hundred years has changed a great deal of things. An oil product called kerosene has replaced firewood in the kitchen of our cities. Motor vehicles using gasoline or diesel oil have put animal-drawn carriages into museums. Steamships have lost against motor vehicles. Diesel locomotives have driven steam locomotives off the rails. Jet planes using aviation fuel fly the skies, making remote places reachable in a matter of hours. That oil is indispensable to our everyday lives is not an exaggeration, either. Yet few of us ever ask how this important liquid is extracted from the earth and changed into finished products. In the first place, it is not an easy matter to find an oil reserve. Exploration teams, sent by oil companies, have to go to remote places, find sometimes have to live under harsh conditions, to explore the earth or seabed for oil. They study the rock and the soil, and if there are promising result, the next thing for the oil company to do is to send a drilling team to the location. Again, this not a simple matter. Roads, for examples, have to be built first to transport the men and materials to the site. What is worse, the first drilling does not always bring about oil. The drilling team often has to drill up to 10 wells before oil is found. Riding your bicycle. When you are riding your bicycle in the street and you came to a corner, you must watch the traffic policeman carefully. He will tell you what you can and cannot do. When he is holding up his right arm, all traffic must stop. When he is holding his right arm out to his side, the traffic which is coming from in front of him must stop. When he is raising his arm up and letting it down again, the traffic from his right side may continue again. When he is holding his hand toward you, you must stop. In these and other ways, the traffic policemen help the traffic to move quickly. Contagious diseases. Contagious diseases are which are passed from person to person. They can be passed by direct contact, or be bacteria in the air. Some diseases are very dangerous and these can spread quickly, causing sickness and sometimes death. In the 14th century in Europe, a contagious disease is called bubonic plague, or black death, killed millions people. No one knew how it spreads and they could not stop it. Today, a contagious disease like bubonic plague can be stopped by modern medicine, but at the time, nobody understood how diseases were spread or what caused them. Even this century there have been outbreaks of serious contagious diseases such as typhoid, yellow fever and cholera. 
Doctors and scientists have studied these diseases can prevent them if medicine is available. Unfortunately, many countries are crowded and disease spreads quickly. When this happens this is called an epidemic. Even today doctors and modern medicine sometimes cannot stop epidemics until many people have already died. Forest Forests the oldest and most diverse ecosystem are important for their products. They also keep soil fertile, ensure the supply of constant water under the ground, regulate the climate and prevent floods. The leaves which have fallen to the ground become some kind of substance. This substance which is called humus is a fertilizer to the soil. Humus holds rainwater during the wet season, stores it and then waters the fields in the dry season. Thus the fields can produce more crops. For years many people haven't been obeying the government's regulations and have been cutting down the trees excessively. As a result, thousands of hectares of what used to be good forest lands have become waste. These people are not aware that without forest nothing prevents the water will wash away the soil to the river. It may cause floods which will destroy the farmland and villages. For all this reason, the State Minister of Development, Supervision and Environment has consistently been trying to keep on asking our people to stop destroying the forest and conducting the campaign for forest conservation. What is global warming? Global warming is a term used to describe a gradual increase in the Earth's average ground and atmospheric temperatures across the whole planet. Measurements indicate that the global temperature has increased by about 1 degree Fahrenheit in the past century. This warming trend appeared during a period when human activities were beginning to increase the carbon dioxide, CO2, and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Although most scientists believe that a rise in carbon dioxide emissions will lead to further global warming, uncertainties remain about the timing and severity of resulting climatic change. Nevertheless, many are convinced that human activities are partly responsible for the long-term warming of the past century and that climatic changes caused by greenhouse gas increases will be a continuing part of our future. The impact of global warming could be devastating. Global warming causes ozone depletion, melting polar ice, and rising ocean levels. The ozone layer, which protects all life from ultraviolet UV radiation, is being destroyed by the release of chlorofluorocarbons CFCs, into the atmosphere. The widening holes in the ozone layer allow in more UV rays, which can cause skin cancers, cataracts, and immune system damage. UV rays are detrimental to pollination, seed production, and marine life food supplies as well. Ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean have receded to record lows, and Antarctic glaciers are melting at a fast rate, causing sea levels to rise and indigenous wildlife to lose its habitat. Rising ocean levels could eventually cause worldwide flooding of coastal areas, forcing people and wildlife to migrate inland. Many experts predict global warming will cause a dramatic increase in excessive rainfall in some areas and severe drought in others, resulting in floods, crop failures, and a rising number of forest fires and landslides. Many of the world's most knowledgeable climate change scientists forecast that the Earth's temperature will rise from 1.44 to 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100 if we don't take steps to reduce greenhouse gases. An increase of 1 to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit will occur even if we do act, because many gases have already been released. Ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean have receded to record lows, and Antarctic glaciers are melting at a fast rate, causing sea levels to rise and indigenous wildlife to lose its habitat. Rising ocean levels could eventually cause worldwide flooding of coastal areas, forcing people and wildlife to migrate inland. Many experts predict global warming will cause a dramatic increase in excessive rainfall in some areas and severe drought in others, resulting in floods, 
crop failures, and a rising number of forest fires and landslides. Many of the world's most knowledgeable climate change scientists forecast that the Earth's temperature will rise from 1.44 to 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100 if we don't take steps to reduce greenhouse gases. An increase of 1 to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit will occur even if we do act, because many gases have already been released. Behavior and Work Habits in the Workplace Smart and quiet behavior in the workplace can cause areas or even fatal accidents. Behavior like this is called horseplay. If you interfere with the work of others or make practical joking, it can also be very safe. Horseplay, running, and throwing objects in the workplace are good work habits and can cause accidents. Bad work habits keep a workplace dangerous. A dangerous worker is messy in his habits. He keeps a messy bench and a messy store. The floor around the bench or machine is never dirty. He always puts rubbish and waste into the wrong bins. In this way, he prevents obstruction of fire. A dangerous worker does not wait for accident to happen. He never takes actions after they happen. If he sees some oil on the floor, he does not leave it there. Somebody may slip on that oil and so he wipes it up. He does not leave tools lying around or on top of machines. Tools can fall into the moving parts of a machine. The machine may be damaged, or the operator may be badly injured. The dangerous worker does these things through habits. As he works, he is thinking of the safety. He is trying to remove the safety. He is thinking not only of himself, but also of his fellow workers. Dear Jude, how are you? My friend, I'm really sorry I couldn't send you an email earlixer. I'm really busy with my final exam preparation. I have to read a lot of books. Besides that, I must attend extra classes for English and science every afternoon and go to the gym at weekends. I really thank you for hosting me during my holiday. It was the best holiday I've ever had. I'm really grateful that I finally could travel to England and explore the famous places over there with you. I can't stop seeing our pictures during the trips. It's really fun to remember our good time together. Jude, I'd love to spend my holiday with you again. Will you come to visit me during your summer holiday? I will have finished my exam and therefore I can take you to interesting and historical places in my city and other neighboring areas. I'm sure we will have a lot of fun, too. I'm very excited about this. Please let me know soon. Thanks again. For your kindness. Melody. Bandung, my hometown, is a very interesting place. If you like shopping, you can visit Dago and Sihampelas. In those area, there are so many factory outlets, which apparently attract many Jakarta people who like to shop. These shops are popular for their cheap price. If you go to upper part of Dago, you will see lots of cafes too. These cafes are famous because you can enjoy tasty food and Bandung beautiful view at the same time. The air is cold and fresh, because there is no factory nearby and very limited number of cars, just like in the old days. Another place that you can visit is Lembang. It is located a little bit outside the Bandung city and famous for the cold air, which is perfect for holidays. Lembang is also famous for cow's milk, baked sticky rice, and also strawberry plantations. In the strawberry plantations, you can pick and eat any strawberries you want for some amount of monsi that you have to pay. You can also eat some foods made from strawberries. The strawberry plantations cause more and more tourists to come to Bandung. Besides that, Bandung is also famous for the tea plantations and the mountains such as Tengkuban Prahu and Kawaputa. Apart from that, Bandung is also famous for its schools. Bandung has a lot of other interesting aspects too, such as various foods and cultural products. I have got an unforgettable experience last Leveron day. My family and I went to my mother's hometown to celebrate, Idol Fitri. We went by aeroplane, 
At the airport, my family and I had to walk through the metal detector. When I got the turn to walk through it, suddenly the alarm beeped. The woman who worked as the airport security said, Come here, you need to get your belt off. I took my belt off, but the alarm still beeped. The security asked me to take my wallet from my pocket. I did what she ordered. Still, the alarm beeped. After that the security asked me to turn back and she checked my body. She touched my left pocket. Then she told me, there was something in it. It might be the thing that made the alarm beeped. I took out something from the left pocket. The woman laughed and said, that has made the alarm beep. It was a silver pen. I felt embarrassed because Eve Bod stared at me with curiosity. My holiday to Bali. I was in Senio's high school when I went to Bali Island for the first time. I went there with my teacher and my friends. It was our school study tour. My teacher, my classmates, and I were in the same bus. We left our school at 8 a.m. The journey from Patti to Bali took one day. I was so exhausted because I had to sit along the journey. Actually, it was an enjoyable journey because I spent time with my friends. We did many things together, like playing games, laughing, and joking. I was tired but I didn't mind. All of my treadness was gone when we arrived at the Sanner Beach, where our hotel was located. It was still early momming, we saw a beautiful sunrise. After watching the sunrise, we were driven to the hotel to take a rest and to have meals. After that, we went to the Nusa Dua Beach. There were so many activities to do there, like parasailing, banana boat, and so on. But, I chose to go to a little island which had a lot reptile. There were snakes, turtles, etc. The scenery was so beautiful because it was in the middle of the sea. Next, we went to Garuda Wizanu Kenkana, GWK. There were two amazing statues. They were Wizanu and his bird, called Garuda. After a very long journey, through the land and the sea, we finally got back to the hotel. Although we tired, we all happy. We could not wait to visit other beautiful places. What are thunder and lightning? Lightning is a sudden, violent flash of electricity between a cloud and the ground, or from cloud to cloud. A lightning flash, or bolt, can be several miles long. It is so hot. With an average temperature of 34,000 centigrade, that the air around it suddenly expands with a loud blast. This is the thunder we hear. Lightning occurs in hot, wet storms. Moist air is driven up to a great height. It forms a type of cloud called cumulonimbus. When the cloud rises high enough, the moisture freezes and ice crystals and snowflakes are formed. These begin to fall, turning to rain on the way down. This rain meets more moist air rising, and it wants the friction between them which produces static electricity. When a cloud is fully charged with this electricity, it discharges it as a lightning flash. Gawai Day or Gawai Dayak